And welcome back to another episode of the Awful Lawyers podcast. How's everyone getting on? Living the dream. Every day an adventure. Yeah, well, the adventure's been cut short this year, in all fairness, with uh, lockdowns. And where you are, it's been a particularly rough. Um, but we'll, we'll get into that. So today we're joined by Mark Ryan. Um, you're well known for playing Bumblebee and a variety of other Transformers. And that's pretty damn cool. You know, you know he's such an iconic character. And then you got to, uh, obviously, you're not a giant robot. You just got to do voice acting for him. So, you know, we'll have a wee chat about that and all the other experiences as an actor. So, again, pleasure to have you here, Mark. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. So, how's things where you are? Um, well, like everywhere in the world at the moment, it, it's been hit and miss. You know, um, the Netherlands started out, I'm currently in the Netherlands. Uh, um, it, it, it was uh, under control. They started early, it started in March with basically a full lockdown which meant I couldn't go to the pub gunnery. So I give me Irish pub gunneries in Alkmaar a shout out. Um, and, uh, or the Willie Scottish restaurant, by the way. And um, these are places that we frequent. We couldn't, you know, we, we couldn't go. I mean, it was locked down, but we were kind of in the midst of moving house as well. Uh, so it was doubly a bit of a bind, but um, to be honest with you, I haven't found the isolation that much of a problem <clears throat> i mean as a writer you tend to uh, be isolated anyway and lock yourself away <coughs> excuse me uh, <clears throat> and um just sit there and, and and work so last year for me was mostly writing um and developing stories and ideas for tv shows and for comic books we got the pilgrim out there which did really well and develop that into a TV show. So um, it, that part of it has not been uh, that difficult. And we've been, my, my wife and I have been very sensible. I mean, it's not, to us, it's not rocket science. Just mm. wear a mask, you know, use the sanitizer <clears throat> and just be sensible about these things. But um, I guess that some people really miss the social life so in the, in the, and they miss a pint and a chat with their mates and they, and they just can't, you know, I understand it's it's tough and it's difficult, but um, at the time we were also nursing an elderly, uh, uh, my wife's mother, but, and so we, we just couldn't take the risk because if she'd have got mm. it, it would have made her very, very sick. <clears throat> um, so we've just been very, very sensible, to be honest with you. Um, and other than the odd trip out, we we have a little boat here that go out, we go out on the lake. So you can't get much more so, socially distancing than being on a boat in the middle of a lake. Yeah. And um, that's it. That's to me is my little bit of an escape and my little bit of heaven. And so I was very. We've been kind of okay with it. So, but I understand that people have, have really struggled with it. And the only problem is um, that's how it's got spread. And. Uh, I guess I mean doing work on uh, viruses in terms of telling stories and, and writing like the pilgrim is about a virus. I understood about airborne um, viruses and, and the mutations and stuff like that. So I had a little bit of knowledge enough to go, I don't like the sound of this. Um, let's just be sensible. Let's just hunker down and see what happens. And so about a month before uh, this all really blew up, I was speaking to pals in London who were on tube trains, you know, and hopping about and wandering around London. And I was going, why are you not locking down? What is going on there? So it seems like a total communication failure in the UK. I don't mind saying that. It's an embarrassment. Um, and uh, then it came full bore. Now here, they've, they've, they had it under control. I think people got a little bit bored about not having to, be having to be able to social life because the Netherlands is very much like Ireland, very much like the UK. It's all about the pub. It's all about the restaurant. I'm but, glad to hear. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm glad to hear. Oh, yeah, no, sure. No, I mean, it's, it's, it's but they call it borrow society here, which is on Friday afternoon. You can't find anybody in their offices on a Friday afternoon. They're all down <laughs> the pub. <laughs> no, seriously. Uh, but it is, you know, the hospitality industry, the hotels, the pubs, the restaurants, the clubs and stuff like that. Particularly in Amsterdam. I'm not in Amsterdam. But it was out of Amsterdam. It's all about that and the tourist trade. And so it's absolutely crippled that business, as you can imagine. Um, oh, yeah. 
But there is that social thing here, and certainly during the winter when the weather here is very much like Ireland and very much like Northern England, it's very grey and damp and rainy and cold. You want to go into a pub and have a have a steak sandwich and a pint, and um, they've had to just cl- close that down because people then started to go back and do that, and of course it's we're now in, in a second wave and it's it's pretty serious. Second pretty wave. Serious. Yeah, we have one of those. Now we're on our third. It's the worst we've ever had. It is uh, god awful. I can't. I don't mind saying this to anybody that's out there that's listening. I don't start me about queuing on because I'll go com- completely off the rails. Anybody that thinks that this is a hoax, you need help because we know at least through people that have died of it. I have good friends of mine that have had it, and they said it's the worst thing they've ever had in their lives. And that um, uh, at least two people that I know that are close pals said, oh, no, I didn't think I was going to make it. I thought I was not going to get I was so weak. I couldn't get out of bed. So anybody that thinks that this is a hoax or it's not real or it's some kind of conspiracy or whatever. Don't just be sensible. This is this is a very, very dangerous virus. If you happen to have a, uh, a, a, a an immune system, which is compromised in any way. And, um, you know, you can see what's happening in Los Angeles. I can't even get back to L.A., even if I wanted to get back to L.A., where mm. my other home is. Uh, I wouldn't go back there right now. I can't. All the hospitals are full. And this is, again, because of people going, oh, we don't need to wear a mask. We can just go out and wander around on Huntington Beach. God yeah. knows what else. And do what you-, you can't. This thing will kill you. And if it doesn't kill you and you give it to somebody else, it's going to make them very sick and or kill them so come on guys let's just get this together start thinking about this sensibly there, it's there a new virus this, we're on the same page here yeah there seems to be this huge debate about masks in general that you know it doesn't take that long you know you're, if you're going shopping it doesn't kill you to wear a mask and you see so many videos of people protesting to them you know screaming their heads off it's it's unnecessary <laughs> Here they 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 um, the big sales p- uh, thing here is uh, uh, one of the big um, changes Albert Hines, and they have literally have people wiping down the handles of the trolleys. You can only have, go in with one trolley each. Everybody has to wear a mask. They won't let you in if you don't have a mask. It's no sorry wear them or don't come in. They mm. wipe down the trolleys. So whatever we use the gel anyway before we go in. There's a bottle before you squish your hands or whatever. And that was the same with Primark or all the big stores. They were doing the whole, you had to do that. And if you didn't do that before you went in, they wouldn't let you in. they go, sorry, go do your hands. You yeah, had to go yeah. do your hands. You had to wear your mask. Just simple. You know, this is not, you know, a freedom thing, really. It's not. I mean, the reason that you wear a mask in a hospital is because it's it's preventing you breathing um, germs onto somebody that might be sick in a hospital and also breathing in. It's simple. It's just a simple barrier. Now, it may well be that you can contact it from a surface, whatever. I believe you can. So that's why you wash your hands and you use that um, the, the 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 stuff. Just just do it. It's this is uh, it's crippling the world's economy at this rate as well as. Oh, us. good luck ever recovering. <laughs> but I, when when people talk about like the economy and like we should prioritize that, it's. it's a bit rough, a bit um, out there. You, you want to be thinking about people and how they're going to recover. And I think there was, don't get me started on this, on Cummings. Um, I think there originally, there's kind of a, was a, a, a right wing thought, let's put it that way, politically, both in America and the United Kingdom about this herd. I heard this being talked about last year, very early on about herd immunity. And again, the only reason I knew a bit about herd immunity because I've written stuff like The Pilgrim, which has got, you know, a virus in it. And so I'd studied the various things, things of this. And I was going, but herd immunity only really kicks in if you've got maybe 80 percent, 70 or 80 percent of the population has actually caught the virus. And then then you're building up enough you know, resistance within the social network that you're going to be able to build a a resistance to it. But that means out of whatever, in America, as we now know, 360 million people, if 1% die, that's 360 million, 360,000 people that will die. 
But that's exactly where we are in the United States right now. There are 360,000 uh, people that are, that are that's killed. And I get into arguments with people going, yeah, but they had underlying things. They had this or they had that or they had whatever. And I'm going, all right, make it 50%. Make it, make it 200,000. Let's be generous. Let's make it 150,000. Let's make it 100,000. You're talking about 100,000 dead. In the yeah. you know, but we're actually up to three hundred and sixty, and they're out now looking at a hundred thousand in the UK. Yeah, this is there was this, this big happened. thing of people saying that they they were, or they getting getting financial aid if they marked it as a COVID death. I don't don't really believe that, but uh, well, even if that is true, I mean, let's just say that it's true, and um, a couple of people that I know that have actually have had relatives that have passed away. Um, during the course of this, uh, they what finally did them in was COVID, but they did have other um, problems. Yeah. So they had other problems, but who knows how long they would have gone for if the COVID hadn't finished them off. So they're kind of given the option. Do you want the COVID or do you want to say it was this? Now, some, I had one pal of mine say, I said, what did you do? He said, no, I said, put it down as the there's the, the cause that they'd been treating, blah, 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 that, that killed him. He got the COVID, but we don't want to put that down. <clears throat> um, but there's no doubt it contributed, you know, to, yeah. to, to the person's death. So this stuff, just oh, they just put it down because they want more money. Uh, right now, at this moment in time, there isn't a hospital bed to be had in Los Angeles County. I, if that really is what the it. profit motive is, then it's obviously that's pretty sick. And they've got a different system in the united states as i know to my cost but um if it's if it literally seriously that that then that is it's just an awful thing to even contemplate but i don't believe that i know people that work in the national health i've got mates that are just tearing their hair out in the national health in the uk going half the staff are sick we're doing double triple uh things in the uh um uh <clears throat> stints because half the staff are sick and if the nurses and the staff get sick who's going to take care of the sick people yeah this is what you know it's, so anyway yeah it is seems to be a um I'm sorry to go on about that i you know we, we no, you're right. we've been we've been very careful for mm. personal reasons i say with an elderly uh, sick person that yeah. did pass away as it happened not a covid um or something else uh, but we were just being careful, and that kind of, I think, trained our mind to just go, let's not, let's just carry on with this. Uh, until this injection is available and it's proven to work, and, and you know, you're not going to have a backlash from some kind of allergic reaction, we're just being sensible and careful. And, it, and it's not been that difficult. But you know, yeah. I feel sorry for anybody that's out there that is, you know, is is really suffering and as i say i've got mates that have suffered and they said you don't want this you yeah. don't want this this is not fun so, yeah we, we have a friend uh from the podcast we had it twice for that and in the end he was okay it was the first time he barely noticed it and then the second time it got got to him pretty bad really yeah um i thought yeah, you could get he, he was, it was he that's it, what i, I thought as well well, they're just saying today that if you've got it, it gives you like 18 months of immunity or nine months of immunity or something like that. But again, there's some bloke on the telly the other day I was watching, is that like three times uh, in the space of a year? So I, I, you go, well, what is, I don't know. It's difficult to know yeah. half the time what the truth is. I mean, you try and go by who and uh, the World Health Organization and, um, and the experts, you know, Fauci and stuff like that, who seems to be a sensible bloke. Yeah. Um, but some of the other, what shall I say, misdirection, um, to be kind, um, or, you know, deflection, is has bordered to me on the criminal. Mm. Um, you know. And the amount of fake news that goes towards it. Yeah, we're, I was about to bring that up. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're media students, uh, so we have to do, um, you know, an essay on fake news. Obviously, COVID came up. Um, I, I avoided politics, so I went really deep into COVID. And, um, you know, there, there's a lot of fake news with us. Like, no, the debt rates um, of 1%, that, that's a lie in itself. That can be 30 times higher in um, poorer countries. 
uh, and they're not that they were accounting for only first world countries when they <laughs> initially said that omissions of fact you know they're at someone's expense yeah i you know i, I guess at some point the proceedings will know really how this started um but again it's there's a lot of short-sighted uh, populism going on at the moment in the world and the idea is that the populist politicians get rid of all the experts because they don't like to be told the truth or don't like to be given you yeah. know a, a, a briefing on something and we can see where that has led yeah. you know um the reason that we hire scientists and specialists and that, that kind of thing is because obviously their advice is going to be something you want to take on board if it if it fits but to just hollow out organizations like um they did with the the wuhan uh, team that was there part of uh, barack obama's team that he sent there specifically to watch um the, the what was going on there and work with the chinese on their viral research and then of course uh, trump pulls the financing and brings them back so guess what happens we, we yeah. don't have really what now what the, at some point in the proceedings we're going to know what the truth is but you know, we don't have it at the moment. Yeah, no. and it's hard for some people. But look, Mark, I'm glad that you got, you know, your creative outlet with your writing. I'm glad yourself and your wife are safe. Thank you. Uh, we ourselves are safe. So I hope everyone listening is in the same situation that we're all yeah. A-OK. -okay. If you're not, be just be uh, sensible. best of luck. Yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Um, but yeah, um, so with Pilgrim, you got an idea of how airborne viruses work. And, yes. Uh, obviously, you know, the timing is unreal, you know, did the research and then here we are as rough. Well, uh, what was even weirder was it's actually an airborne um, weaponized version of Ebola. So, um, which in itself is a difficult thing to uh, people get their heads around. And I wanted to make it something that was scary in its own um, way, but, but actually people weren't going to go down the garage and try and make it. And so, um, <laughs> try to see if they can manufacture it <laughs> and so in in the pilgrim it's an airborne version of ebola because ebola is a blood-to-blood -blood, you know transfer type um a, a, a viral disease so um we made it a weaponized version just because it you know it's a scary thing to have as a as a weaponized know, virus sounds scary yeah, yeah. Mm. and so. uh, you know so that's what we but again to do to write that stuff i and um and pal of mine, Jason Connery, was working on a, a film called Pandemic. And uh, he asked me what I knew about it. And I just happened to have a bunch of books about it. So it kind of reminded me of all of this stuff some years ago. So he, he, I lent him a couple of books that I had on, you know, viral studies and all that kind of stuff. Well, yeah. What did you uh, think of that new trailer, Sunbird? Have you seen the trailer? I think Michael. No, Bates I haven't. It. To be honest with you, I've been a bit um, remiss. In fact, I just did a film this morning. We did a press thing for uh, uh, the Berlin film, uh, independent film thing, for uh, the Reckoning. And I haven't seen that either. So, Neil Marshall, but you see, the reason that nobody's seen it is because they can't show it. So, poor old Neil, we did this film and it's, you know, over a year ago. And he sent me a link and he said, you better, you, we're going to do this thing, you better see it. And he sent me about 20 minutes before we did the interview this morning. So I said, I've got time to watch it. So to be honest with you, I, I've been a bit remiss about watching uh, TV uh, stuff, um, really. I've been glued, I must be honest with you, to the TV, to the machinations that have been going on news-wise in just about every other arena. Um, whether it's CNN or MSNBC, I, I, I've been glued to that. But I'm, I, I have to do some catching up with that type of show. Mm. Yeah, okay. well, have we've got plenty of time trailer? to catch up with things right now. So, have you seen yeah. the trailer? It's like, a, yeah, like, I've seen it. And like COVID in four years. Yeah, like, basically, like if, if you're not immune, they, they they shoot on site if you're caught outside your house. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah. That's yeah. Um, I'm sure there's some people in the states. I'm not, okay, I'm, not, I'm discriminating with the states. I'm sure there's some people out there who think that could be a reality someday, but mm. it's not. That's kind of out there. It's being, I think that that's just the point of it. It's just to be like the most out there possible. Mm. We could be watching that like in the same year, and COVID's long dead. And you know, I see I seen one tweet. It was great, and it was like you know, five years from now you could be putting on a jacket and 
you find a mask in your pocket and you're thinking like, what a crazy time that was, you know, when we're all back to normal. Yeah, it'll happen because, I mean, God above, I grew up, you know, I'm, you know, I'm 39 plus. And um, I've been 39 for the last 20 years, so. Uh, Congratulations, and, uh, you don't look a day over 20. Well. <laughs> you always drink quality alcohol. There you go. That's the secret. See, we, we preach this, but people don't listen. I'm glad you're here, Mark. It, it preserves. See, see the... we're in our 40s. People don't understand this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. It preserves the inner, you know, whatever. Anyway, um, and uh, I remember being at school. We were just talking about it, about having a, a, all the other stuff, mumps and all the other stuff that was out there. And they used to go to school. They used to give it to you on a sugar lump, you know, and they'd pop a sugar lump with whatever stuff they were trying to kill off but it worked it worked it, we you know we didn't have any um uh, all of that stuff that's out there that, that chicken pox and all that kind of stuff you know mm. or if you had it you know it, that you had a little small dose of it and that was it that made you immune so um this again about not wanting to take a shot is because some people genuinely believe that there's a chip in it they want to cheat That's stupid. chemically. Now, I, mean, I, know, I know a lot of people who are like, I'll wait a while and I'll see about it. I think that's kind of a weird attitude. It's, it's been out for a while. People have been taking this for, I don't know, the kids could have been taking it for over a month at this point. And they've been okay. Well, there so are zombies. People saying like, we're, they're going to hold on uh, until they know a few people who have it. It's, it's a bit out there. And the chip idea, the Bill Gates chip idea, it's just, it's, just, it's, it's hilarious. You could write a movie about it. It just... There you go. There's a bit of, of a right well, people idea. have been also the, in, even here, and and I guess maybe in the UK as well. People are, are blowing up five G cell towers because they believe. Really? I, I remember. I remember. St- I hear stories about that. That's, they that's, they, were, they were destroying five G cell towers. Right. <laughs> they thought it was mind control. Yeah, you know, like my, my mom's had the vaccine. She she's a, she's a nurse. And every time she walks to the room, my phone goes from 4G to 5G. It's great. Like, <laughs> it's, it's terrific. The ben- uh, people don't understand the benefits of this thing. It speeds up your, speeds up your, you know, internet. Is that what you're trying to say? Exactly. There you go. Thank you. It's, it's like they talk about the mind control thing, but faster internet is not a bad price to pay. No, you can always stream episodes of Black Sales or see you know what I mean. It just help me with my royalties and just you know, crack on or try a Transformers film. Every time oh, you do that, you know. there you go. What was it like doing Black Sails? <laughs> oh, that was a huge show when it came out, and then like its, it's legacy still holds on. It, it's kind of in the same realm as like Vikings would be. Um, it actually reminded me in many ways uh, of Robin Sherwood. Not that I want to go back to you know uh, that particularly in, 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 unless you do. I mean, obviously, Clan did the music. There's a whole story about that, but. Um, it reminded me, the atmosphere reminded me the same because you kind of become aware that you're doing something really unusual. And when we did Robin and Sherwood, we all had that feeling. You know, we all kind of got it. We, I don't know. And, and we gelled as a group very strongly. Ray, Clive, Jason, and I, Michael, everybody. We, Judy, everybody gelled. Nikki, Grace. And it, 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 we became a very tight little unit and even to this day Ray Clive Jason and that we're very we're very close mates to these days to this day and everybody you know um uh we still talk to each other birthdays and just cheer each other even, even during these lockdown days and I have felt the same about black sales um and Toby and I I mean more different characters you could get you couldn't get to uh, playing mates supposed to have been guys that have known each other for years and I mean Toby comes from theatrical television royalty I mean his mum is Maggie Smith you know um, and his dad sir you know uh, um, was a uh, was a, was literally a, 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 a king of the West End and, and Royal Shakespeare Theatre so Toby came from a very difficult different background to me you know musical theatre mm. you know that kind of stuff and we got on like a house on fire and uh <laughs> I could say every day we giggled like little schoolgirls most of the time. It was an embarrassment on the set because we were just like, we're pirates. We're both. Uh, <laughs> we're like, so cool. Oh, just, 
Big, big Butch Pirates. And um, it was great. And uh, the scale of the thing, obviously Michael Bay being involved, uh, the scale was just off the planet. I mean, they built two full-sized galleons that were sitting in this um, tank that they dug in Cape Town, South Africa, specifically for the show. And um, they it's built crazy. that NASA. dedication. Oh, it, it was unbelievable. And when you were actually on the boat, they built them, I don't know how many tons they actually were, but they built them on these massive hydraulic gimbals so that they could actually rock the boats, oh. these gimbals. Well, if you were inside the boat and not able to look out the window and see the horizon, which is not, you, you got seasick. And a lot of the makeup girls and wardrobe girls couldn't actually be on the boat because if, because if they were locked in while we were filming, they felt seasick because of the, the motion. And that's what makes you sick because you can't see the horizon. Your brain can't mm. make sense of it. So, um, uh, the scale of it was just monumental. The writing was brilliant. And because of the relationships between us as a group, I think a lot of it came out extraordinarily well. And I had some of the best dialogue ever written for a character, probably, that I'm ever going to get. You know, I've been extraordinarily lucky with that kind of thing. Mm. So it has the same, um, it has the same, to me, aura as Robin of Sherwood, which has a life even to this day, mm. it's Robin is still a cult show, you know, 37 years later or something. So. Jeez. You know, it's impressive sometimes, you know, people make a show and it bombs. And then there's ones like the one you've done, you've done there. And it's just, it's going to stick around forever. Yeah. It just, it's just going to be constantly looked back on or used to compare other things in similar genres. Um, but it's amazing to see. And this obviously wasn't your, your first thing with uh, Michael Bay, yourself and himself with um, Transformers. Ten years with Michael, I've had, you know, we did, I've worked on all the five films that he um, directed I'm on the set with him. A lot of people don't understand this. They say, well, when do you do the voices? Do you go, I said, no, oh, no, I do it on the set. So for a decade, basically, all five films I've been, because it's like a two year cycle. Um, I've been on the set coming up with voices and being different robots. I've been everybody on the set. I've been Optimus, Transformer, Roll Out. I've been everybody on the set and um, Megatron. And, and the, the journey, the, the, to me, the, the technical side of it, working with um, Industrial Light and Magic, watching how they developed you know, the computer-generated stuff over that, that decade, Originally, I think on the third film, or did we have it on the second film? We, we had a 3D camera on the second film. It was literally the size of a Tyrannosaurus Rex because it was on a, on a huge thing, gimbal with a crane and a mm. massive thing with two cameras side oh, by crazy. side. And by the time we got to the last film, Michael could literally pick up the 3D camera like a, like a, a, a briefcase and run around with it. You know what I mean? It, it went from that to that within the space of us making five films. And um, the, the rendering and the detail that they're able to do. And I def I'm very happy to defend the Transformers films. I mean, I think it was an enormous achievement. I don't think they need defending. I think they're pretty okay. Oh, they're, they're uh, you know, it, you'd, you'd be surprised. I mean, I do get the odd hate mail because I'm not a Volkswagen Golf, you know, a, a Volkswagen Beetle. <laughs> And, and, a, uh, and a, say, why, why did you choose to be a Camaro? I went, I didn't choose to be a Camaro. <laughs> that wasn't what to do with me. Um, so, yeah, no, it was a lot of groundbreaking stuff. And I got to work with amazing people, you know, yeah. Francis McDormand, you know. Which, or, as an actor, is always a pleasure. Oh, my God. You know, if, you if you're working with co stars who are garbage, you know, it's not going to be very good. <laughs> but if you're working with, you know, top of the line, you know, polished actors, you're going to be doing pretty okay. John Turturro, he brought in some some brilliant people to <clears throat> to work with, you know, and I, and I had the honour to be able to stand there on the other side of the camera with Michael here and them there and the sound guys here and the microphone <clears throat> and occasionally got to invent something like lockdown oh. was completely, literally a spur of the moment thing that... Um, uh, a, a true story, you know, I was sitting, literally waiting to go down into this quarry um, where we were shooting a scene with Mark Wahlberg and, and I, I, I'd done so many different voices from when we first started. 
I was reading the dialogue and trying to come up with something. Um, you just got zapped by a Dalek or something, unless that's that's me that did that. Um, uh, and um, I didn't know what I was going to do. And I was looking at the dialogue. And, and as I was watching it, I was at a TV going in the room. And there's an advert uh, that plays in America for Jaguar cars. And uh, the advert just came on and it goes, why are all the bad guys in Hollywood films? Why do they all have English accents? Is it because of a certain sense of style? Is it a certain sense of banana? Now, literally this advert for Jaguar cars. And I suddenly heard Anthony Hopkins in my head, who gave me some advice <laughs> years ago. And so I kind of went, oh, a bit of Anton Sugar and a bit of Anthony Hopkins, a bit of, you know, Hannibal the Cannibal and a bit of Anton Sugar. Okay, let's try it. And uh, we had <clears throat> on the set these two huge sound boxes so that I can have the mic and I can do the dialogue so everybody can hear it, including the other actors. Uh, and I have a headset so I can hear direction and what's coming from Mike and all that kind of stuff. And um, we had the Cayenne Porsche car with the camera on top. And I was running at the side of the car with them all mic'd up with the hand mic, looking at the monitor because he wanted me to time the dialogue to the explosion where Ratchet gets killed. So it's a very dramatic moment, you know, and they're going to paint it Ratchet getting killed in a minute. And, but I'm running at the side of the Cayenne and I'd said to the guys, I said, they said, what are you going to do? I said, I don't really know yet. I said, well, I want to try something. I want to do it really, really quietly. So can you whack up the sound on the set so that the speakers knock this sound out? And I'd, we were in this um, old harbour area that was part of that hollowed out in the rock and everything. Massive old thing. So as we started to do this, and I got the cue from Michael to start doing the dialogue with the timing was, I just literally went, you know, Autobots, Decepticons, always making a mess. And then I have to clean it up. Literally as quiet as that. But because the mic was wired up to these huge Pink Floyd bass bin sound things, this voice, this thing sounded like the voice of God. And it <laughs> literally, it sounded like the sky had opened up. And gone, Autobots, receptacle. Literally, and everybody on the set went, oh, my God, what is that? Yeah. <laughs> it was massive. It was literally these huge bass bins that made this noise. And everybody looked at me, and I thought, oh, gosh, <laughs> I wonder what, what effect that's had. And I looked at Michael, because he was actually right next to me. We were running together by the side of the thing. He looked at me, and he went... <laughs> <laughs> so I went... Okay, we're, we're we're in the right we're in the right ballpark. So, mm. so that kind of create helping to create a character like with Jetfire, you know, I have a bit of input into Jetfire as mm. well, uh, and that kind of stuff. And um, sometimes they fill my face and they plant it onto the character. Like if you look at Lockdown, you'll see it's very much my face, and they mapped it and digitally, you know, all that kind of stuff. Ten years of 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 literally right on the edge of of. Um, cutting edge of the business and again working with people like Anthony Hopkins you know just amazing experience who recognized me would you believe from 1981 or something you know first time I met him I watched that interview you did earlier on where you told the story of him giving you advice and then he recognized where he gave you it that must have been that, extraordinary extraordinary and he, he tested me. He wasn't, he didn't, he tested me because he said, I knew I'd seen, I know we'd met before. He said, but was it, um, was it The Strand or was it uh, Soho? And I said, it was Soho. Was it Dean Street or was it, um, uh, what the other one, uh, the other street next door, um, where where the theatre is, the Vita Theatre is anyway, I can't think the name's going out of my head. And I said, I think it was Dean Street. I think it was not Wardour, Wardour Street or Dean Street. I think it was Dean Street. And he went, and what did I tell you? And I told him what he told me. And he went, that's what I would have told you. So very interesting. He remembered. He said, I never forget a place. I never forget a face. And uh, he said, it's, uh, he was great. He was great. Fair place, man. Um, yeah, with, with the character of, of Lockdown, um, I thought one thing that kind of freaked me out was that he turned his, you know, his face into a, a cannon. <laughs> uh, I remember I watched it in cinema with my dad when it came out, and I'm just kind of sitting there like, 
why doesn't anyone else do this? Yeah. I, uh, I, turn I thought it was really the, cool, but it kind of put, gave me some shock at the start. I, I do that in the pub, but I, I turn... <laughs> <laughs> he's, a, he's a head on him like a cannon. But uh, no, I turn it into a snorkel. You know, <clears throat> uh, <laughs> into a snorkel. It's easier. It's just. A... <clears throat> there you go. Jesus, it, it sounds like you love the pub a little bit. Oh, you know, I, I do. I do enjoy a pint. Uh, you yeah. know, not so much the pints anymore because I, I do love the pints. But, um, you know, particularly the Guinness. I do like the Guinness. Uh, but I, I just have to pace myself. You know, when you, when you get a little bit older, you know, you, um, it's not so easy to work it off anymore. <laughs> so yeah. I'm more in the wine now. I'm more of a, of a wine, a white wine or a red wine. You know, yeah. Right now. And w where do you prefer to get your wine from? Uh, we usually buy it. I mean, we, or obviously, if I'd go to a pub and have a glass of wine or something, but you know, we're, you usually go and buy it near so that we can. I like to have a sit and it's one of my guilty pleasures to have a glass of wine of an evening shouting at the television. You know what I mean? My wife's very tolerant with me. She just puts her earphones on and watches. There you go. <laughs> Midsummer uh, murders or something, you know what I mean? And I'm screaming and shouting at CNN or whatever. So, <laughs> yeah, I, like, I do like a glass of wine. <laughs> It, you know, it's, it's crazy how Americanized the world has gotten. Yeah. Uh, we talk about this a lot. Like, you know, you, could, you couldn't have a clue. Sometimes you wouldn't have a clue what's going on in your own government, but you have like detailed knowledge of what's going on in the States and huge opinions about it. And um, it, it's, it's a weird phenomenon. Um, I only realized it one, like one day when I was having a chat with my girlfriend about American politics. I was like, oh, what's, what's the Irish government to that? Uh, nothing, absolutely nothing came to mind for either of us. Well, it's, it's, I guess it's one of the things that frightens people about globalization, if people are frightened of globalization. But, you know, I think what broadens people's mind and acceptance um, of different cultures and different ways of life is travel. And I've been very lucky to have been actually been paid to travel to go to work, you know. So, I, I, the travel broadens your horizons. You know what I mean? And, and, and it, you realise there is another world out there, um, mm -hmm. other than the one that you you live in in the local village or the local, you know, and, uh, whatever. And South Africa again, going to Cape Town to me was a, an amazing experience. I'd been to Africa before. But I'd not been to South Africa, and I hadn't, obviously Cape Town was one of those places that it's just a unique place. Mm -hmm. So to be working down there for a year was was uh, absolutely gobsmacking. But you get to see the real poverty, and you get to see the the obscenity of the wealth, and um, uh, you get to see that dichotomy of a society that's kind of doing well and 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 pushing forward and and there's always going to be people that fall by the wayside uh, and it reminds you you know that there is a different world out there beyond your own you know the mm. world your own village sort of thing yeah and from you know from small town ireland you know i guess some people from our town or thomas's village it's so it's so weird to say village to americans are like are, are you kidding is it actually a village a little <laughs> huts and everything but yeah like yeah, you know, I said small life England, small small life um, Ireland to be very similar. You know, you wouldn't be thinking about these things or your, your holiday is to Spain. Your holiday might be you go to France once and then you leave it at that. that, that that's your exotic trip. Mm. Or Italy if you want to go crazy. I live in Valley Village in Los Angeles and trust me, it looks nothing like your village. Trust me, it's not. It's nothing like you would think a village should be. But Thomas has uh, two stores church three pubs three, three pubs and also one, one of those stores is like a like a gas station so mm. and then i have uh two takeaways as well in case you're hungry everything you need like yeah, there you go exactly. yeah we, we got sushi here recently in my town and uh not a hit with the locals in all fairness but uh <laughs> uh no because we're, their... we're landlocked as well it's 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 a bit weird um but yeah, they only do delivery and they they plan on only ever doing delivery. Like they're never going to like have tables inside. It's kind of weird. 
Takeaway sushi only. How crazy Take is that? Takeaway sushi. I don't mind way. some sushi, but you've got to just make sure that it's fresh and all that kind of stuff. But if you're mm. landlocked, it's obviously not coming straight out of the, unless there's a lake or something nearby. Yeah. <laughs> there's a canal. It's pretty nice. Yeah, there's a canal, but if the fish is coming from that, I do not want that in my boat. No, because people <laughs> No, <laughs> no, sir. Constantly. <laughs> the, the stuff you find in there is unreal. <laughs> the amount of like beer bottles in there, it's, it's where the fish are having a better time than us. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I kind of with the sushi thing. It, it kind of goes back to the pubs as well. Like you wouldn't enjoy drinking at home as much as you would the uh, like the, the knife the in the crack. pub, the crack, the crack. You, exactly. have the crack. you want to be having the crack, and um, the, the crack's kind of dead at the moment. In all fairness, the experiences yeah. of like going to restaurants or pubs is gone, and that kind of dulls it for some people. Like. You get a bit of fun if you get a takeaway, but you know, even at home, I found myself not making the same stuff all the time, like same dinners. It's gonna be the same. It's just gonna be garbage. You're not, no, no excitement anymore. Well, it it will turn. It, it, you know, I do have faith in that. But what the world's gonna be different. I mean, somebody that's flown as much as I have around the world. Um, I know it's going to be different. I have no desire to get on an airplane at the moment and sit with, you know, 300 people for 12 hours and then breathe in circulated air or next to somebody or whatever. It's, I just don't have that desire. I'd rather sit it out and wait until, you know, this is really settled down a bit. Mm. So the world's going to be different. Shopping is different already. The high street is different already. But to you what know? end do you think? Sorry? I said, to what end do you think? Like, what do you think that stops? Like, are we going to be wearing masks in hospitals forever now? Oh, I, I can see us wearing masks for years. I think that's actually not too bad. That's probably safer. That's something we wouldn't have thought about. Um, I think they'll, by the end of this year, we'll probably get a good idea of of where things are. Um, mm. Maybe by the summer, we'll get a, an indication of where things are headed mm. and whether they've got control of it or not. But even if, as somebody was saying yesterday, I was listening to somebody talking about getting the uh, the vaccine out in the united states they would say well even if we get it out massively even if biden goes tomorrow get all of this vaccine out there it's going to take a month to basically get it distributed and start getting it into people's arms and then you've got to have a, another month where you wait for the second vote so even if <clears throat> by the end of this month biden tomorrow said right we're doing it end of this month get it out there you've got to ship it out get it out into people's arms you're talking about a month, and then you're talking about another month, February, March, mm. April, before you actually yeah. see any real result, whether the curve starts to come down. And um, uh, so we're talking about May, maybe, before we, we get a real grip on are the numbers dropping, is the infection rate dropping. If you look and at then, the world over, overall, it's not. It's still on the rise. It's still on the rise. And there's been very few moments that it stopped. And it's actually amazing with where so you can see all the times America has peaked because they're very they're very noticeable peaks in the uh, in the chart, but no, yeah. it's it's not going down yet, sadly. So I think we're looking at probably certainly the summer before we even get a glimmer of where this is going, and probably um, late summer, you know, for before we we if we're going to get it under control by then. And certainly some of the restrictions are still going to be on until the end of this year. That's that's as far as I can see. I mean, I have to, I've got to go back to the States at some point in the proceedings. So I'll probably be flying back there, you know, July or something. So hopefully, um, you know, there, there, enough, there will be planes to get on <laughs> because at the home. moment the, the airlines are, uh, are struggling. So, you know, it's going to change a lot of things. It's yeah. going to change a lot of things and, and it's going to take a while to turn it around. I have no doubt we will. I just, it's going to be, it's going to change things. Yeah. I think we're expected to be vaccinated by September, is it true? Like um, most of Ireland. I, I haven't been keeping up with that, to be honest. I, I kind of like to avoid it. Yeah. <laughs> avoid the news. If, if they show up tomorrow and offer it to me, I don't care where it goes. Just give it to me. <laughs> 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 I honestly don't care. Um, uh, look, I'll be walking around giving people 5G. That's going to be great. <laughs> uh, do, you, do, you need, do you need a boost? It's just come here for you can just radiate 5G you you can walk around. You know what I mean? Be careful, though, that someone doesn't want to decide to set you on fire because, you know, 
if you are radiating it, you might be trying to read people's minds. That's the other thing, you know. Yeah, that's no, that, that's another perfect. thing. Um, but my tinfoil hat says otherwise. You know what I mean? Take notes. It'll protect uh, you. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> and just, that's a story in itself. But as an actor, how, how has this lockdown affected you? Like, are you doing all your work from home? Or are you just taking time off? Um, I've got, well, I, I've been very, very lucky. You know, it's funny because Ray Winston and I, we were talking one night with some mates and I keep saying lucky <clears throat> and I get told off for saying lucky because Ray said, Marky, Marky, you're not lucky, my son. You make your own luck. And I said, well, Ray, I, you know, then we've been fortunate then in our careers. And he went, oh, yeah, yeah. I said, I said well, we have been fortunate because we, there's plenty of barriers in this business to get from A to B. There's plenty of things in the way to do what you want to do. I said, we've been very lucky that we, you know, he said, yeah, do you know why? And I said, I don't really. I've often asked myself that question. He said, because we didn't know the barriers existed. So for us, they just didn't get in the way. We went straight through them. And I thought about what he said. Uh, it took me a while and I went, you know what? He's absolutely right. Mm. If you actually don't see the negative, if you don't see the barriers or the you know thing to get from A to B, you tend to just keep going and the barriers don't exist for you. Because I've had people say to me, well, you went from Evita, right? A, you stepped into Evita in the West End, legendary West End show with Harold Prince to Who Dares Wins to Robin Sherwood to the, you know, this, this, how did that happen? I said, I don't really know. <laughs> I don't really know. I just traveled, hopefully. And if I was given a job where it was working with Bob Anderson on first night or whatever, you just try and do it to the best of your abilities and enjoy it and learn from it. So that's been kind of my philosophy. Um, but it's, uh, as, as a writer as well, I've written like three books about the history of, tarot cards and the imagery and the psychology of Celtic, you know, imagery and stuff like that. And so um, I've always written and it's not a big step for me. I enjoy all three, whether it's writing, singing, the musical side of stuff or, 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 or acting, I, all three are the same to me. It's all the same process, um, different outcomes and all that kind of stuff. But, but, but so writing to me has been good. So this year I've been able to we've got like three projects in development with companies in Los Angeles um, that hopefully one of them will, 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 all of them will get picked up. I hope one of them would do, uh, would do. Um, and they're all interesting shows. So one of them, you know, is we try and obviously develop the pilgrim as a TV show. So we're working on that. And um, there's a couple of other ones that I'm involved with, but I've always been involved with that, either helping other people produce projects uh, or, you know, I'm one of those people that sees a connection, so I just make the connection and don't mm -hmm. necessarily anything out of it. I go, oh, that person could work. Oh, that would work well. So I've just been kind of one of those people that have facilitated, if you like, um, relationships for productions as well, which it, it's always paid me back handsomely and goodwill or whatever, you know. Yeah. So for me, that part of it, I've spent a lot of time doing this, doing Zoom calls and Zoom meetings pitching shows and working on projects and helping other people with their projects and writing bits of stuff, you know? Um, so I've, I've, it's really not been that difficult, you know? Well, again, glad, glad to hear it. Glad it's working out for you. Yeah. Well, it's like improvise, adapt and overcome. There's no point in moaning mm -hmm. about it. Get on with it. You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm. it, it's, it, we are where we are in this. And I've always had that thing, you know, just going, well, you make the best, of it, you know what I mean? And whatever life throws at you, you just tackle it and, and try and make a positive thing out of it. Yeah. For me, the glass will, the, the Guinness glass will always be half full. It's never half empty. It's always, it's I'm always half. You know, and, uh, you know, if it's tough, when it's tough, when the guy gets tough, the tough go shopping. Except there's no high street to go shopping anymore. There you go. So you've got to do it online. <laughs> I've done plenty of it. I'll actually show, yeah, you, I do. I'll show if, you something after getting here now. Give just so you there. know, I've got mates of mine that have been filming even in the middle of the pandemic. And what they're doing and what we've had to do with one of the projects that I'm involved with, which is a film, um, is come up with a concept whereby we can, and this is what they're doing now, 
I won't tell you because it's, it, but it's an ongoing show. They just finished filming in Canada. And what they do is you fly in, you get tested, you're isolated for two uh, uh, weeks to make sure that you, then you go into the bubble, which is a hotel, which they take over, where all the crew, all the cast, everybody is in that hotel. They're not allowed out. They can't go out to the pub. They get their food in there. They are isolated within that bubble. And they uh, get picked up by the same driver that is also in the bubble. They go to the set. They film on the set with the same people. They don't go off the set. They stay in that bubble. They get in the same wagon with the same driver. They all go to the same hotels and they stay in the hotel. Food is brought to them. Everything they need, their laundry is done within that bubble. And they keep oh, the virus on the outside. So even in these situations, the people have been able to shoot stuff. It costs more, obviously, and you have to have a higher insurance for, for, for medical issues. But um, even during this time, things have been shot and completed. Yeah, I was on set for the last duel and they got finished up. They were, they were militant about masks. Apparently, I had the wrong mask one day and they were ready to fucking murder me. What was um, done? Uh, the last duel. Okay. And I'll show you what I had. This is the exact same one. Um, because this has a filter. Yeah. Um, I was I was many murders. I know it has a lot of layers. In all fairness, it's got four four layers to it and a filter. I thought, oh, I've, I'm gonna be grand. I have a state of the art one. I'll be doing okay. And then no, but they just gave me a disposable one and said, get a new one. And I did. I did. I didn't complain. Um, obviously, you know, there's stuff at risk here. There's people jobs. People's jobs. Um, you know, the, the whole industry is on show. So you gotta behave yourself. Yeah, we, we wear the little, you know, medical ones all the time, just going out, if we go out shopping or whatever, you know, even if we're getting in the car. Do outside? You know, we had, we actually bought some of those as well. We actually had, my wife and I had the ones with the filter and somebody said, no, the filter is actually useless because um, it actually doesn't filter. <laughs> it's yeah, not designed for that. Too. No, um, uh, you're actually better off wearing one of the medical, just a little paper, not paper, whatever that material they're made of, which is actually filters more than if you've got one with a big hole in the side. So, mm. anyway. Yeah, it's fair. Okay. But whatever you need it for. Like, I've seen people going out there with basically gas masks and hazmat suits. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a bit too far. But, uh, sure. Yeah, but there are clubs for that particular type of thing on a Saturday night in Dublin. If you want to go with your rubber suit and, and a gas mask, there's, there's special places for that. You know what I mean? Mm. It costs a bit extra for an evening out, but you know what I mean? And then you get hosed down or sprayed down with something. Yeah. And, and, you know, and every, you know pop. everybody's good friends at the end of the evening. You know what I'm saying? Things <laughs> you'll do for a pint. Sorry yeah, things will do for pints. <laughs> um, I've seen some awful things people have said that they do for a pint at the moment. <laughs> Fair play to them. <laughs> I remember they did takeaway pints here. I know that was a big hit. People love that. Yeah. Takeaway pints. And then the tea shop said no more and gave yeah. out to everyone. And yeah. Was, gave everyone a tap on the wrist and said, Yeah. Like, it was like takeaways could stay open. So they're like, Oh, we'll do takeaway pints. Takeaway yeah. pints. Yeah. Takeaway pints. Save yeah. the plug. And then, so like, I don't know what it delivery or did you pick them up? Uh, I think you had to pick them up. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not sure to be honest. Like, imagine like four pints coming to your door. And like, Oh, that's me, that's me sorted. <laughs> Yeah, that'd be an experience. <laughs> and why not? That's what I say. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, 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 I'm trying to make it like harder for us to drink here at the moment because uh, obviously alcoholism is a problem. Uh, we're, we're pretty guilty of that in Ireland. And uh, it's gone up crazy during the lockdown. So oh. they've been a bit militant on it. I think it's, it's, I think it's fair. But um, mm. here's the thing. If you make alcohol more expensive, they're still going to go for the cheapest one. You know, if you make 10 cents uh, more expensive, that's 10 cents being taken away from the kids food or something. If people have genuine alcohol problems, you know? Well, and it is a lot of, you know, as you do when you're a young man in London or whatever, <clears throat> you know, particularly if you're on a show or something, people tend to drink. You know, I, I enjoy a drink. I, you know, I, uh, I'm not an alcoholic. I don't wake up in the morning and think, well, where's, where's my next shot of bottle? Where's the pint, yeah. Um, you know, but certainly I do enjoy uh, uh, a glass of wine, but so do the French. So, you know. There you go. I don't, I, as long as it's done within moderation, but I do understand mm -hmm. it can be an issue for people. 
And I've got mates that, that have made that decision uh, just to stop drinking because it was affecting their lives. I know people that have said that to me and said, can't do it anymore. Um, and I, I, I'm sure he won't mind, but one of them, John Hurt told me once at a party, because of course he was a famous drinker. And um, we were, again, I think it was me, Ray and Clive, we were actually on the set of 1984. And we were watching Richard Burton and uh, John Hurt do the scene, the famous scene where he's sitting in the chair looking out over the hills. And we actually were there watching it. And um, we got talking to one of the ADs and they were we were there for hours and nothing moved, nothing happened at all. They were waiting for the light or something. And I got to, I said, uh, what, what are they like? I said, no, I said, man, they said, they, every day we put a bottle of rum, bottle of vodka, bottle of scotch, bottle of this, bottle of that, bottle of gin, in each wagon, about six or seven different spirits in each wagon. And at the end of the day, it's all gone. <laughs> it's gone. And I said, oh, Christ. He said, the weird thing is they come out and they're both word perfect. They'll come out and they just two or three takes, bang, done. Yeah. Bang. That's literally. crazy. It's crazy, right? No, sometimes you'd stumble if you, if you just had like a pint. Never mind, like all those bottles. And I bumped, I saw, I saw John at a party and I said, You won't remember, uh, probably. But I said, We came down to see you. He said, No, I love you. I've got no idea. I don't remember any of that period at all with Bert. I thought, God, <laughs> wiped out. And I said, But I hear that you stopped drinking. You're not, not doing it anymore. I said, No, love, I had to, I had to give it up. You know, I said, What, what, what was the switch in your head? He said, Lovey. It was getting in the way. It was getting in the way. And I love my business. I love what I do. And it was just getting in the way. So it just had to go. And I think there's a switch for some people. You know, they just, some people can do it cold turkey. Some people need help. And some people mm -hmm. can just go, no, nah, it's getting in the way. It's just not, it's not helping me do what I want to do. So yeah. Then, and I mean, power to those people. Yeah. Um, you know, the drink is a, is a, it's a curse at times, but, you know, mm. if you can get through it, fair play. We had a uh, we had Dr. Rob Kelly on. He's a addictionologist, and he was severely addicted to drink. Where he lost his family and his house, and now he's a self-made millionaire. Like he's, no. he's was he? He said he was Gordon Gordon Ramsay's best man as well. Mm. He, uh, he helped, helped Rob, Robert Downey Jr. get get off uh, drugs or whatever. Same with Eminem. Like he's he's yeah. amazing. But there is, and again, I've done quite a lot of work in recovery in Los Angeles with people. You know, I know a lot of people who are you know, famous who have, have had issues and stuff. And again, I don't I don't really, you know, it's their business. I don't really talk about it. But I've done mm. a lot of work with a lot of folks. Some of them, obviously, I've, I've talked about, you know, China, the wrestler, was was uh, a close pal of mine. We, we, we helped her for years and years and years. But there's just some people that, no matter what you do, no matter how sober they become for a while, you know, the, the least thing can push them back into that corner. And and all you can do is fight for them and help them and support them and try and do that. But they have to um, make that decision for themselves. Yeah, that's a big thing. And one of the one of the stories that I tell, because it's true, is um, I was, we went, had to go to New York to try and find somebody to bring them back to LA. And, and we'd gone up there to try and talk this person into coming back. And I got picked up by this guy uh, at LAX to go back to uh, the rehab where these people were because they wanted a report of whether, you know, what we've been doing and stuff. So I'd gone up back, was being driven back by this guy. And um, a guy sitting in, sitting in this van, driving it back. And uh, he looked at me and he went, he said, uh, you annoy me, ain't you? And I went, yeah, I'm annoy me. He said, yeah, I'm annoy me, yeah. Uh, he, he said, how do you know? He said, oh, I just can tell looking at you. He said, I know you're, you're normal. I said, yeah, I can have a drink. Don't have to have a drink. Stop it now, have a drink. I don't care. You know what I mean? I don't do it. I've never done any drugs. I'm not interested in it, you know. Um, I said, what about you? And he said, oh, man, I was, you know, under there for, for, for 15 years or something. So I said, what, can I ask you a personal question? He said, yes. Can I, what was your bottom? I hear a lot about people talking about hitting the bottom. So I'm curious to know what your what your bottom was, because I don't know what really that would be. And he said, well, I was driving around South Central Los Angeles 
I was dealing drugs. And I had two friends of mine sitting in the front of the car that were school, you know, hood friends that I'd gone to school with. And one was driving the car so that I could deal with what I was dealing with. Another guy was riding shotgun security for me. And I had one last delivery to do. He said, oh, so I had a wad your money. And I'm not only that, and he said, you have to get your head around this as an addict. I had drugs for us for the weekend left over. I'd sold stuff, made money. So I had money and drugs for the weekend for us. We were going to party. And I'd still, I'd still got stuff left over. And he said, so I go to this last thing. And we do this last deal. And we pulled off onto a side road so that, you know, I could just count up the money and look at the drugs we've got left and what we're going to do for the weekend. i got two guys sitting in the front of the car. I'm standing in the back of the car. And um, these are schoolboy friends I've gone to the same school with. And they turned around and they emptied their guns into me. They shot me five or six times. And I said, what? He said, yeah. He said, I've got a bullet hole through here. I've got a bullet hole. He showed me one went through there. I've got a bullet through my shoulder. It went through my shoulder. One went through my, bounced off my rib cage. He had like five bullet holes in him, right? And he said, I said, holy shit. He said, they wanted the drugs. They wanted the money. My own, my own guys shot me, dragged me out of my own Cadillac and left me in the gutter to die, stole my car and drove away, leaving me bleeding in the gutter with five bullet wounds. I went, holy crap, that is a bottom. That I've never heard anything like that. That is a bottom. He went. Absolutely. That that's was, like some breaking bad shit right there. Like that's he said that's that wasn't the bottom. That wasn't the bottom. I said, You don't need to tell me anymore. You don't need to tell me, tell me anymore. So people have the everybody's got their own you know, bottom that they hit, I guess. Yeah. Uh, I hope someone's keeping track of how many times you said bottom, but you know. Bottom. Yeah. Very important. Very important word. Very. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that's that's really rough. And so some people just have it that way. Um, again, I guess I've never hit the bottom that bad. Uh, and I'm, I'm assuming we're all on the same boat there that we're, we haven't been shot five times, robbed, and our car stolen? No. Okay. no. Not yet. I had a, I had a, a nasty uh, sausage roll in Tesco's once that made me feel a bit queasy. But other than that, I've, you know, I've been... Oh, my God. And <laughs> which story is more tragic, I ask? Uh, yeah. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Tesco sausage rolls. You wouldn't trust them as far as you can control them. you got to be careful. you got to be careful. Oh it's a rough God. world out there, you know? It is. But, you know, with people like Mark Ryan out here, we'll be safe. No. Mark, Mark, it's been a pleasure talking to you today. I'm glad we've had you on. Um, Anytime, I'm, you I'm know. We could shoot the shit. Oh, yeah, we, we, we played it and miss with the emails a bit, but it's all because of what's yes. been going on over Christmas and the uh, New Year. Yeah. So, you know, I've had a very interesting life, you know. I mean, if you want to ask me back in time, I'll just talk to you for of course. an hour. Right? Oh, yeah. Eventually, you'll just... What happens to normal, normally is that people just kind of go into like a comatose state. Because they're just listening to, and they go, I can't take anymore. Can, can you stop him talking? <laughs> stop him talking. Don't tell me another story. Well, I think we had you matched because that's all we that's all we do. You know, we talk. So there you go. Um, Later in the year. Later in the year. Ask me about it. I'll, I'll tell you some more. Stuff. 100%. We're happy to have you on again. Yes. And Mark, if people want to check you out, where can they find you? Uh, um, uh, right at the moment, we've got uh, uh, an autograph thing going on. If you, I, I'm on Facebook and I'm on Twitter as well, and I I do have a thing on Instagram. And at the moment, I'm actually doing a promotion for uh, a photographer um, for Transformers. So if you go to my Instagram, uh, which is uh, Mark Ryan official, or the official Mark Ryan, I can remember which way around it is. You'll find me because there's pictures of, of me there. Um, and we're doing we're doing that. We're looking at doing another pilgrim uh, the following uh, up of the other pilgrim after the story uh this year with mike grell my mate mike grell top man top top artist and we've got another few things going on out there at the moment so but you can find me either on on twitter um i think mark ryan 243 um uh, instagram official mark ryan or, or facebook you'll find me on facebook but uh you know i've got a few projects floating about out there at the moment so mm. yeah. come support come there you go <laughs> well, they know where to find you so again, Mark, it's been a pleasure. Thanks, guys. Uh, Thank everyone so for much. watching or listening. And uh, as we say, 
Have a good one. Take it easy. Top of the morning, lads and ladies. Support for the Off the Irish podcast is now brought to you by Manscaped, who is the best in men's below the waist grooming. Manscaped offers precision engineered tools for your family jewels, and you'll no longer need the look of the Irish with the ladies. Make every day feel like St. Patrick's Day for your balls with Manscaped. Get 20% off and free shipping with the code IrishPod at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at Manscaped and use code IrishPod. Use the right tools for the job and trim your pant potatoes.